Hi, this is Professor Unmack, and I put together this PowerPoint video for you to hopefully help you understand the arguments laid out in Madison's Federalist 10 and Federalist 51. I asked you to read those for this week, but they were written in 1787, so some of the art arguments might be a little bit hard to follow. If you are interested in listening to somebody read Federalist 10 and Federalist 51 aloud to you, you could go to this website, learnoutloud.com, and they have audio versions of all of the Federalist papers. I like to listen to audiobooks, so if you're interested in that, you could take advantage of that resource. So in Federalist 10 and Federalist 51. Essentially, what Madison is doing is laying out a justification for the overarching uh, big concepts of the United States Constitution. And essentially, what he's arguing is that the way the framers of the Constitution tried to structure the Constitution was in order to resolve what I sometimes call Madison's dilemma. And that's the need to give the government enough power to get the job done, to govern, but also guard against the government abusing its power and infringing on the people's natural liberties. And that's a big dilemma in a democracy, because on the one hand, we don't want to give the government probably as much power as Hobbes thinks we should give the government. At the same time, we don't want to forget Hobbes's statement about the need for the government to, to keep order, at least at a certain level. So we know at the time of the founding, at the time the Constitution was written, the Articles of Confederation made the central government really weak. And so part of what the Constitution has to do is give the national government more power. And they do that by strengthening the uh, powers of Congress, for example. When you read the Constitution, you'll see that Congress is given the power to tax. Congress is giving the power to uh, control currency. Congress is given the power to regulate commerce between the states, etc. But we want to avoid too strong a central government so that we can protect people's individual liberty. And so Madison defines this problem in Federalist 10 and Federalist 51. And he makes the argument that the biggest threat to liberty in a free society is caused by factions. So for Madison, balancing the need for liberty and order is a tough balancing act. And the biggest threat to liberty comes from factions. So a faction is any group of people who don't represent everybody's point of view. So essentially, any political party would be a faction, any interest group would be a faction, a union would be a faction, a uh, nonprofit organization like the National Rifle Association or Planned Parenthood, any organization that promotes a particular political viewpoint could potentially be a faction if they got involved in politics. And Madison's primary concern, sorry, my PowerPoint doesn't move smoothly from one slide to the next. Um, so Madison argues that the biggest threat to liberty comes from large factions, because if a faction gets big enough to be the majority of people, and that faction gets control of the government, then in a democratic society, there isn't any way to stop that faction from becoming um, a tyrant essentially, if what that faction wants to do is against the natural liberties of the minority. M Madison calls that mischiefs of faction. And he says that the Constitution is designed to guard against the mischiefs of faction. In today's language, we would probably call that tyranny of the majority. Uh, this is just a quote from Mark Twain, who is pointing out the problem with the democracy, which Madison points out as well, is that if you let every decision be made by the majority without any checks on that majority, then that majority itself could become a tyrant and infringe on people's liberty. And Madison wanted to make sure that we, uh, we didn't do that here in the United States. Yeah, it's not a perfect system, and we know that we've had lots of tyranny of majority um, in this country, but what Madison argues in Federalist 10 and 51 is that 
what the framers of the Constitution tried to do is put some checks in place so that tyranny of the majority would be less likely. So Madison argues that we can't actually control the causes of faction because doing so would require that we take away people's liberty so that they wouldn't be able to form factions. So for example, take away people's right to property so they wouldn't fight over um, agricultural interests versus industrial interests or farming interests over recreational interests um, or or if we took away religious liberty, then maybe people wouldn't fight about which religion uh, should be the dominant religion, et cetera. So if we can't control the causes of faction, what do we do? Madison says, well, of course, we control the effects of faction instead. And Madison argues that you can't control the effects of faction just by setting up a democracy. But it's a good place to start. Democracy allows the people to have a say in their government. The democracy is not a monarchy, so there's not just one person in charge. But again, democracy has that sort of fatal flaw that if you don't put any checks on the majority, you could end up with tyranny of the majority. So what Mar Madison says is that we need to take extra steps to prevent tyranny of the majority. Madison calls them auxiliary precautions. We can call them extra steps. Things that are built into the Constitution itself to try to stop one faction from having an easy time uh, taking over the government. And essentially there are four of them, or five if you break one of them into two, but I'll just put them in as four. One is a large Republican form of government. So there's two things in there, a Republican form of government rather than a democracy. And the fact that our republic is going to be large, large in terms of territory and large in terms of the number of people who are going to be governed in this Republican form of government. The second is separation of powers, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. I just want to lay them out here for you. The third is checks and balances. And the fourth is what we call federalism. Each of these are discussed in your textbook as well in chapter two. So there's more than one place to get this information in addition to this video. Okay, so a large Republican form of government. So the difference between a democracy and a republic is sort of reflected in this picture. In a democracy, the people vote directly on what the law should be. And, the, and what that means is there's nothing to stop these people whenever they're afraid or angry or hateful. Uh, it, it, there's nothing to stop them from passing a law that could restrict the rights of people they're angry with or afraid of or uh, that they don't like for some reason or another. Uh, in a Republican form of government, these people, all of these people, are not going to be making the laws themselves. They're going to be choosing a smaller number of people who will then get together to make the law. And what Madison argues is that puts a check on the, on the majority because elections don't happen every day. Elections only take place every few years. So in order to change these people and put in new people who might hate the same group of people or be mad at the same group of people at the same time, et cetera. You have to wait until an election happens. This gives, um, Madison says that this gives people's tempers time to cool. It passes our passions through this elected body. So each of these representatives is going to be representing lots of people. So they can't just take into account what they think or what one small group of people thinks. They have to take into account what lots of people think. And that theoretically is going to lead to more um, enlightened lawmaking, as, as Madison uh, puts it. Eh, sometimes we could disagree with that when we look at how our lawmaking bodies tend to function, but this is what Madison's theory suggests. So a Republican form of government is an indirect democracy. Republican, a Republican form of government can work over a larger geographic territory than a democracy, because only a few people are going to have to leave their homes and their cities and travel to wherever the legislative body is meeting. Um, and everybody else gets to stay home and do their work and live their lives without having to worry about lawmaking responsibilities. 
a Republican form can also have a lot more people in it, right? A democracy, a true democracy would almost certainly have to be fairly small because people have to be able to get together um, and talk about things and then vote on things. And it, the larger the territory gets and the more people who are in a direct democracy, the more cumbersome and unwieldy that pro process is going to be. But if, for example, our House of Representatives only has 435 people in it. And so it's a relatively small body of people who are then going to work on lawmaking uh, between the House and the 100 members also of the Senate. So Madison sort of sums it up this way. He says, in a large republic, there's going to be more people. It's, there's probably going to be more factions because the more people you have, the more different interests there are going to be. And the more factions you have competing, the less likely, theoretically, one faction will be able to dominate the political process. And they'll be forced to compromise and sort of work together to get things done. And this, theoretically, will lead to less tyranny of the majority. So separation of powers, separation of powers is actually pretty involved in America. On the one hand, separation of powers is very straightforward. You divide the government into separate parts and give each part a different power so that even if one part of the government gets captured by a faction, they don't automatically capture the whole government because the powers are separated. So in our system, we divide the government into three separate parts the Congress, which is the legislative body, the uh, presidency, which is the executive power, and the federal courts, which are the judicial power. And each of these branches has different powers. So if you look at the Constitution, Article 1 lays out the powers of Congress, Article 2 lays out the powers of the presidency, and Article 3 creates the federal uh, Supreme Court. The framers of the Constitution were really worried about Congress being able to exercise its power um, tyrannically. So they further sub, sub, subdivided the legislative branch into two chambers, the House of Representatives and the Senate. And the way the lawmaking process works, legislation has to pass both the House and the Senate in order to become law. So if you can see this playing out in American politics right now over the issue of gun control, for example, the House of Representatives has passed legislation that would strengthen America's gun laws, but that legislation is sitting in the Senate and the Senate has not voted, at least at the time of making this video, to uh, act on that legislation. The other thing that separation of powers does is it gives different terms of office to each of the branches. So the House of Representatives, they serve two-year terms. The Senate serves a six-year term. The presidency serves a four-year term. Judges serve for life. And what that means is that at any given election, we're not electing all three branches of the government, all of all three branches of the government. So if there's one faction that happens to sort of catch fire and catch people's imagination, it theoretically would take a long time for that faction to capture all of the branches of government, especially the judicial branch, since they serve for life. And then to further complicate things or make it even more difficult for one faction to take control of the government, each branch of the government um, is chosen by a different selection method. So, for example, members of the House of Representatives are chosen by smaller parts of the population of their state. We call them districts. So California has 53 seats in the House, but we only get to vote for one of those 53 people. Everybody uh, lives in we have 53 different congressional districts, and each of the districts, the representatives are chosen by the people who live in that district. Senators are elected by the whole state, and the president, of course, isn't elected directly by the people at all. The president is chosen by the Electoral College, which functions across all 50 states and, and the District of Columbia. Again, it's designed to make it more difficult for one faction to control how all of the branches of the federal government are chosen. This next slide just shows you the districts in the House of Representatives. This is just, again, this is, sorry, I had to pause for a second and now I'm trying to catch my, catch my uh, 
brain up to my mouth. This is a picture that depicts the 53 congressional districts in the House of Representatives. You can see they're numbered from 1 to 53 from north to south. So we live where I am sitting, and American River College is in uh, the 10th congressional, I think it's the 10th congressional district, this one right here, um, which is represented by uh, Doris Matsui. I actually live in a different congressional district. So I get to vote for a person to represent me in this district. If you live in this district, you would get to vote for a person to represent you from this district. But these people get to elect this representative and these people get to elect this representative and these people down here get to elect um, this representative here. So that's part of separation of powers. Checks and balances goes hand in hand with separation of powers. Not only did the framers want to make sure that one faction didn't take control of all three branches of the government at the same time, but they also wanted to ensure that if one faction took over one part of the government and started trying to abuse its power, there would be a way for the other branches of the government to potentially put some checks on that. Keeping in mind that the framers of the Constitution didn't anticipate the development of political parties, which makes checks and balances and separation of powers work less effectively than uh, Madison uh, anticipated. So this is just a slide that explains a little bit of some of the ways that each part of the government can check the other parts. So, for example, these dark green squares represent separation of powers. The legislative branch makes the law. The executive branch enforces the law. The judicial branch interprets the law. These lighter green explain some checks and balances. So, for example, Congress can pass a law, but the president can veto that law if he doesn't want it to go into effect. The judicial, ju the judicial branch can review laws to determine whether they're constitutional or not. The president can um, a, uh, nominate people to fill vacancies in the federal government, so cabinet positions and judicial positions. But the Senate has a check on that power because the Senate has to approve those appointments. Congress has the authority if they think that the president is abusing his power or her power in office, they can actually impeach the president. So checks and balances, there's lots of checks and balances built into the Constitution. But again, the overall purpose of checks and balances is to allow the different branches to keep one particular part of the government from abusing its power. The, um, this slide just shows how they sort of work together. Um, these are This is separation of powers. And then again, it, it explains how each of the branches can check the other branches. So the courts can declare laws unconstitutional. Congress has to approve um, the nomination of federal judges. So they have a check on the uh, judiciary, et cetera. Um, separation of powers and checks and balances. I assigned for you to watch a kind of a funny, but also educational, uh, video about separation of powers and checks and balances as well. And there's a discussion about this in your textbook too. Federalism is the last of the what we call auxiliary precautions. What federalism does is, so separation of powers separates powers amongst the national government. Federalism separates powers between the national government and the state governments. So Congress has specific powers in the Constitution, the power to coin money, the power to regulate commerce, the power to raise an army, the power to declare war. But whatever powers are not given to the federal government reside in the states. So states are responsible for education policy, for example. States are responsible for conducting all elections and deciding um, how, what the ballots look like and, and that kind of thing. And most laws are actually state laws as well. So what Madison argues is that federalism helps sl slow the spread of bad ideas because we have lots of different governments controlling lots of different things. So, for example, the example that Madison gives is if there's a rage for paper money, that is a uh, something that the poor people wanted after the under the Articles of Confederation so that they could pay their debts with cheaper money. So Madison says so in Georgia, if there's a. Um, a rage for paper money that might take control in Georgia, but it would it would have to spread from state to state to state to state to state to get um, the to get enough laws passed to put that into effect. And because there are legislators 
um, from different states going to Congress, it would s- slow the spread of bad ideas. Um, the other thing that federalism does is it allows states to be what we in modern times call policy laboratories. What Madison alludes to is the idea that if a state wants to experiment with a particular way of doing things. So, for example, California decided that you shouldn't be driving your car and talking on your cell phone unless you have a hands free device. Now, that might be a really good law, but California can't just impose it on the whole country. And if California passes a bad law, let's say, for example, that the California ban on straws turns out to be a really bad law for some reason. Well, it only affects California. It doesn't affect the other 49 states unless the other 49 states decide to adopt that law. Maybe it'll turn out in the long run that we don't think it was such a great idea to legalize the recreational use of marijuana. Well, we can always change that law, but it only affects California and it only affects the states where they've also adopted recreational marijuana. Um, And so different states can say, yeah, you know, I think I'll hold off on legalizing marijuana until I see how the effects are in California and Colorado and Alaska, et cetera. So federalism is a way of guarding against tyranny of the majority because there are lots of different governments in control of lots of different things. Now, federalism also makes things a little complicated because the federal government, for example, says marijuana is illegal and state governments can say, well, marijuana is legal. And then you've got some conflict. And we'll talk about that a little bit next week when we focus a little bit more uh, on federalism itself. So anyway, that's my uh, take on Madison's Federalist 10 and 51 and the auxiliary precautions that are put in place in the Constitution to try to stop one faction from engaging in tyranny of the majority. Talk to you later.